Brill. So you should all now see my uh, my pretty front slide. I've got a thumbs up from here. Fantastic. Brilliant. Well, um, thank you for Nigel Liam for inviting me along to do this. I saw Nigel's email and it rang with a number of things that we're currently dealing with with our master's provision. And so what I thought I would do for this 10, 15 minutes is to share where we're at, see where it fits with everybody else and then share some of the ideas we've come up with about how we can give um, a non-lab master's project to our students as we're going through. Now, um, this stuff doesn't come out of nowhere. Um, we had a very informative seminar from David Lewis from the University of Leeds, David Lewis from the University of Leeds on Monday, who's been doing a lot of work around here. So he's inspired us with quite a few good ideas and I have shamelessly nicked some of his slides for this presentation. So they are uh, they're highlighted as we go through. Um, Keith Miller and Lucy Crooks have also been contributing a lot to what we've been thinking about. So I'm gonna share that as we're going along. Okay, so the current position we find ourselves in is that we run four or five different master's courses at the moment, and they are predominantly recruiting international students. So the first problem we're going to come across when we think about what we can do with our students is we're going to have visa restrictions. So we're going to have to take that into account. Not everybody can stay until we can get back into our labs. Um, our students have come to us wanting wet lad experience. That's one of the primary reasons that they chose the courses that they're on. So they they came to the UK September last year wanting to learn practical skills. And in my little photo down here, this is all of them at the end of their lab development sessions where we've been basically building them up to do a wet lab research process practical. Um, like many of you, our assessment criteria has been set long before the beginning of this was even on the horizon. The, we wrote the guidance material for this this time last year. So we have set criteria in which we need to work. And a local problem for us is the way that we've designed our provision is that our students do literature reviews, which they did this semester, and they also did a research proposal about the work that they were going to do within the lab. So they've got an expectation that they're going to be doing, that they wanted to be doing wet labs. Now, the problem with all of that is the labs are shut and we can't get in to do that. It is uncertain when we'll be able to get in. And even if we could get back in with our students, would we be feasible in actually running those labs in the manner in which we want to do? So that's set us thinking about what we can do as alternatives. Um, we have a number of limitations then, if we are going to deliver, deliver these projects in the way that we think about. They're gonna to need to be completed at home. So we're all home working. I can see everybody's little screens up here. I'm gonna have a second screen with you all on. And you're all sitting in your houses. Their projects are gonna be done at home. That means they might not have access to bespoke software that we would have had previously if we were delivering on campus. They could have gone to the computer rooms and used the proteomic software that we've got unloaded onto our machines. So we're gonna to have to make sure that whatever projects we come up with, they can be delivered in the student's own home. The other thing we're gonna to have to think about is not everybody has done a non-lab project before, has even supervised a non-lab project. So there's some staff development to be thought through about how we can upskill everybody ready to deliver the non-lab projects. Personally, I would like to use some of the software with one of mine that I want to run, but I've never used it in the past. So prior to running the project, I'm gonna to have to learn how to use the software. The other thing we're gonna to have to take into account is summer's coming. Summer is when we take our holidays. Quite a lot of us have childcare commitments, our children will be off, so we're gonna be away taking those. So we need to think about how we're gonna do that. And our final limitation is a local one for us is that our assessment is predominantly through a written submission. Now we do have some flex in the way that we wrote it about how we can go about altering that. So there are limitations, that's what, they're the, the boxes to which we are constraining ourselves. So we've got ourselves a framework then. We need to, meet our student expectations. We need to make sure that the master students we've got leave 
with new skills because that's 100% the reason they came to see us in the first place. Our delivery, um, like many of us for these types of projects, is lab, would have been lab based over six to seven weeks. We're going to take into account staff holiday. They're going to have to be completed at home. Because these are master's projects, we need to ensure that they're inquiry based. We need an element of data analysis within them and they have to fit within our existing assessment criteria because we really can't go about changing that at this late stage. We can tweak the boxes, we can treat the, grid, the grids we use, but the wholesale changes aren't really gonna happen. Our context then is that they have to be related to the degree that they're doing. So we've got farm biotechs, we've got biomedical, we've got analytical chemists, and we want them to be able to develop employment opportunities coming out the back of this. The skills that are going to be developed, we want them to gain new knowledge and with anything, look, we want them to go away with a new employability skill to say they've learned something that they can then go away and do. So that's our framework. So delivery is online, considering do the students have the tech? If they do have the tech, how are we going to interact with them? I'm going to suggest it's probably going to be via Zoom for quite a lot of people. How are we going to support them? If they're in the lab, we would have popped up every day to say hello. We're going to have to think about distance support. And in terms of teaching this, to take into account the holidays that might be coming up, we could be thinking about doing this in subject groups. So a team teaching approach, either split along the lines of the courses the students are studying or the research groups to which the projects fall under. So that's, that's the idea for the delivery or one idea for a delivery. You've got to remember all of this. We haven't actually done it yet. We're still working this through. So hopefully ideas will pop out today. So what can we do then? What are our potential project areas? I'm going to go through a couple of ones that we've come across that I think fit within the framework that I've set. I'm very aware that this doesn't cover the full breadth of alternative lab projects that are available. So there aren't any educational pedagogy projects within this list, although they are really good. And we, we do run those ones every year with our undergraduates. But this set, I think, is what fits within the expectations of our master's students. So we've got data analysis, public understanding of science, bioinformatics, simulations, systematic reviews, and we have the opportunity to take advantage of the current situation and the data sets that have been released to look at COVID-19 ones. Now, as we're going along, I'm going to be popping up ideas. If you've got ideas or projects that fit within those categories or in this sort of area that you'd like to share, even just titles, please put them into the chat because we can collate those as we're going through and share them after the event. OK, so what could we do? Well. Data analysis, um, a lot of us are active researchers, which means we have existing lag data that we can get our students to analyze. Now, analyzing data on its own is not a master's project. So part of that can be the development of the process to which to do the analysis. So we can supply our students with existing data. In some way, we're gonna get them to develop a process, and I've got some ideas, and then we're gonna get them to analyze it, and write it up. Now ideas for that, or things that we've run in the past, um, quite a lot of our students arrive with us with coding experience, which is fantastic. So we've run projects where we've got students to write Python scripts or R scripts or C++ scripts that analyze a given data set that hadn't previously been analyzed in that manner. There's the caveat on all of that though, that it does require the student to be able to code or the staff member to be able to supervise the student in learning how to code. So that works quite well. We've had students take immunohistochemistry images and develop image J um, scripts, which can then be used to run through the different images and quantify the results coming out the other side. So they're, they're developing, the project is a development of the process. And we've had pro students developing databases for mass spectrometry imaging. In part of that, we need target peptides. So they've gone through and looked at our target peptides, gone through the databases and found different ones, pulled together a searchable search engine with all of the different criteria that are likely to produce. So data analysis in that manner can be done quite well. Other things we can think about doing in terms of data analysis is to take existing lab data, 
analyze that and then use that to inform a literature review and start pulling out data from the literature, which then undergoes a similar analysis before then writing a further research proposal. This was something that uh, Dave Lewis mentioned to us on Monday, which I thought was a, a particularly nice way of taking existing data. So we have that sort of data analysis type of work. Now, data is freely available to quite a lot of us in a number of different ways. There are big databases of available sets that we can go and plunder for our projects. So the World Health Organization will have a lot of data there that we can go and use. There are the figure repository sets that many of us will have had to upload our research to when we supplemented our journals. So Figshare, you can download the raw data for um, papers within, um, articles within papers. And journals like Nature have a big long list of repositories where they would like you to submit your data. So we can get hold of new data sets to analyze in different ways. The, if we don't have existing lab data, there is other sources of data that we can go and get to generate the sets to which our students can then use. Other types of projects that we could consider are things like systematic reviews. Um, we, um, we use the term systematic reviews and literature reviews quite a lot. And it was only recently that one of, our, one of my colleagues said, well, I don't know what the difference between a systematic review and a literature review is. In terms of a systematic review, what you're typically doing is defining a re research question before you start. You're searching for studies in and around that particular research question selecting those studies and then extracting the data out of those. From that data, you can then analyze it and synthesize it and interpret the results in a new light. So it's sort of meta-analysis in another word. So systematic reviews will work really well in the current situation. There's a large number of data sets out there, there's a large number of papers that the students could go and go through and extract the data and then cross-correlate and reanalyze as a larger set. As an example of one of those systematic reviews that um, I personally have run in the past, I asked the research question, was there a link between metal homeostasis disease and early onset dementia? I got my student to pull out all the papers they could find on metal homeostasis disease and start culling them down to the ones that then mentioned any links to early onset dementia. From that, we developed a list of target proteins that could be um, implicated in both situations and we mapped those using a gene expression um, transcriptomic databases the different parts of the brain to see if they light up in the same area that the neurogeneration did so that formed a really nice project um, it was doable from home and all of the materials the student get hold of so systematic reviews probably a good idea could work quite well the other thing that was mentioned to us was simulations. And I hadn't really thought about this until Monday, but I thought I'd throw it here for everybody else to think about. Um, systems biology has given us a vast number of computational and mathematical modeling of our biological systems. Quite a lot of these models are open access and the programs that run them can be downloaded locally and analyzed and manipulated. So if you can find the right model, I found I was playing with the cell to see what would happen in all of this. You can define your research question, model it using the computational software that already exists and analyze the resulting outcomes that come out and potentially then write that up as, well, how would you then follow that up with biological experiments? And that could be the process of your thesis. Bioinformatics and proteomics studies lend themselves really well to this as long as you can get hold of the software to do it. So in bioinformatics projects and proteomics projects, we can go mining of existing databases to pull out new bits of information. Good side of this, it's great for students with an experience in the area and doing it. So they've already done a module on this. They know what they're doing and the projects are there waiting to go. The cons from doing this, students without the experience in the programs that they're using might struggle and some of the tools required are quite bespoke and don't necessarily always run nicely on a home laptop. So 
they're good, they can work really, really well. And finally, we thought about maybe, well, we could do public understanding of science. Surveys can be generated and distributed during the current time. We can use and look at, and these are examples directly from Lee, so thank you, Dave, for these, the public attitudes, the knowledge of antimicrobial resistance, attitudes of use of animals in education, and interaction between developers and clinicians. So all of these survey typing um, projects do meet the frameworks that we put in place. There's a lot of thinking and data analysis in producing these. Now, the final thing that we've got is we can try and capitalize a little bit on all of the data sets that are currently appearing and open access to us. So there are a large amounts made publicly available around the current crisis. There's patient cases, there's death rates broken down by country and region. The Office of National Statistics has released loads of data to which we can go and look at. There's regular surveillance data coming out. Viral genomes are being published all of the time. And so if we wanted something that is going to pique the imagination of our students, there are projects that they can go and use existing data sets that are developing as we speak and develop their projects based around that. So in summary, we've got a limit, we've got a, a fairly fixed framework, at least locally with our master provision about what it is we need to produce. There are a number of projects that we can do that meet all of the objectives that I think or I hope would keep our students happy. And you never know, the good things about doing this kind of stuff is it's gonna open up a whole new world of areas to us in these projects. We might find simulations that we can use in our teaching going forward. We might find data sets that we can use for better assessments next year. We can find better ways of conducting our surveys. So there's good silver linings we could take out of all of this. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now and we'll take it from there. I've not been looking at the chat, so I don't know the questions as they're coming through. That's fantastic, David. Thanks very much. Uh, we've had a couple of questions. It's one from Ian is, would a legacy data analysis of the pharmacological potential of phytocompounds, looking for data sets to support these and incorporating these with clinical data sets be an MSC project, in your opinion? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, because you're, you're drawing together data sets from two places. There's clear analysis in there and the student is having to synthesize new knowledge coming out the other side on the back of that it's not just reporting what's already occurred i think the key thing is as long as they're taking the data and doing something with it then we're we're meeting the objectives fantastic uh, we've also had a couple of mentions of resources that we could use so the cochrane website apparently has training resources which uh, can be used for measure analysis software it's all free and also CEBM Net, uh, which is used for systematic reviews as well, which would be great. We have a question that I think uh, perhaps Robert might be best placed to actually answer, is that are systematic reviews permitted under the RSV Advanced Accreditation Framework? Uh, yes, they are. The important thing about both capstone experiences on BSc Honours degrees and the practical aspect of advanced accreditation is there must be a research hypothesis. The idea is that the, the student is contributing to knowledge in their own way and feel as if they're a genuine scientist, if you understand what I mean. So um, anything that's a, a paper-based review, you've used the expression systematic review and meta-analysis, must have a research hypothesis and the students generate something. Now, of course, that can be from um, databases, as you said, but also data from uh, published sources. But what it, what it mustn't be, in either case, is just a review of what other people have already discovered. Does that kind of answer your question? I hope so. Maybe any you could put it uh, in the chat if that answers your question. Yeah, he says, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>